Hello, folks. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. We are a nonprofit organization, and we've been having at least 20 years of worldwide experts in health to share information so we can be proactive in our health. And today, we are very lucky and delighted to have Dr. Roderick Lane. Uh, he's a genius. He just knows so many things. Anyway, he's been practicing natural medicine for uh, almost 40 years in London and Jersey. He studied at the Howell College, Shendong Institute, and also studied classical Chinese medicine as a part of his martial arts training. He specializes in endocrine issues and fertility. Endocrine issues can cover a magnitude of problems and symptoms. He's the co-founder of the London College of Natural Medicine and is acknowledged as offering one of the best naturopathic training in Europe. Since starting the Thyroid Care Group, which is on Facebook and MeWe, mostly on we, we, MeWe folks, so that's something you definitely want to check. Um, um, with no publications or publicity, this has grown from a group of a few to almost 2,000 worldwide in under two years. It's led to the development of what he calls his Thyroid Protocol Roderick, um, which aims to make a difference in people's lives and health. Also, one might remember what uh, naturopaths might have done in the last century. They have certain skills that they can diagnose people using um, techniques that have long, been long forgotten in the Western world. He is a genius of that as well. So with all that, welcome, Roderick. Thank you for the invitation. Um, hello, America. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> good morning, America. Can I go good morning, Vietnam as well? Okay. <laughs> Okay, do you want to just start talking about thyroid or do you want people to ask questions? However, you... I, will, I, I, I will throw in a few bits. You know, there's been a lot of talk about COVID of late and it being a pandemic. What is not recognized is that um, thyroid problems are endemic throughout the Western world. Um, they're, you know, there's all number of reasons. Uh, the increase in mass farming which has reduced the cell biome the reduction of actually people going out and putting manure on the ground whether it be from people or animals um, the lack of iodine and of course the just general include increase in toxicity and pollutions hello yes. we have a request to speak louder um, let me try. how's that any better Okay, right. Uh, please excuse me, people. I'm actually deaf. I lip read um, up 60%. So uh, I never know whether I'm shouting or whispering. So it's always a um, dilemma. Uh, um, physician heal thyself. Uh, you know, deafness is uh, uh, associated with th poor thyroid function, ironically. So most of the things that we're looking at in our aging population and rather frightening, you know, anybody who's involved in um, systemic medicine here of any kind uh, um, is noticing that the termination and the things that we associated with aging people 40 years ago seem to be creeping backwards. So we're finding them in 30 year olds, where we, what we used to find in 60 year olds. It, it, you know, I, I wrote a book called, you know, um, whatever it was called. <laughs> Oh, here we are. And here's one he made early. Um, the science of aging backwards. Uh, but the science of aging backwards seems to need now seem to be what we're talking about the 60 year olds, we're talking about the 30 year olds. And it's catching up with people and the drug burdens. And I learned something very interesting from a, a client the other day, and I'd never really put it together. The most common Mm, digestive uh, medicine used in the UK for acid reflux is contraindicated with the use of um, thyroxine supplements. Actually says it's on the little piece of paper. I never realized that. The amount of people wandering around with low thyroid on thyroid medication who are being given antiacids. And it actually says when you look in the deep literature, don't take this if you're taking thyroid medication. So we're, we're facing an endemic crisis and the only way we can actually handle this is not with medication, not with doctors, uh, not that I'm trying to make myself unemployed, you understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but basically grabbing the, 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 the problem by the throat, voting with your feet and doing things for yourself that can be done and can be done simply. You don't have to spend 
masses of money and trail yourself from one endocrinologist and natural physician, functional medicine guy to another, spending thousands and thousands of pounds on tests. You can actually do fundamental things. Uh, some of you will be aware of the work of Dr. Sarah Myhill. Uh, she is actually not acknowledged as one of the world's leading experts in chronic fatigue, ME, CFS. And she uses a process that she calls uh, Groundhog Day. She keeps coming round and round and round to the same vitamins and the same minerals um, and the same dietary needs in chronic illness. And ironically, I have something I call baseline nutrition. And last time Sarah and I sat down and actually chatted about this, these things mirrored each other by about 90%. There seems to be a common nutritional need that if you were to do something, if you were to do these basic things, a lot of humanity's problems would go away. So Stephen, people, questions, you know, I can go on for years talking about thyroid and bore you to tears. I have a horribly long list called the unbelievably horribly long list. And it goes, it goes for 10 pages, 10 pages of thyroid dysfunction, just like that, that you will find. And they pretty much, you'll find it on MeWe, Thyroid Care Group, free to download. You'll pretty much find virtually every single thing that walks into a doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> on this list. It is actually frightening. Any questions so far? Well, I mean, given your naturopathic orientation, um, I think the first question to ask would be um, talking about how people can re-relate to mother nature and to go forwards in terms of delaying aging instead of backwards and, and uh, cult cultivating it and what are we doing that is you know what is society doing what are the technologies that we're doing that are um counterproductive um interestingly one of the first chaps to actually put his finger on the pulse for this and in the modern term as a modern physician was um dr hay um and you know uh the story of Dr. Hay is um, very, early, very early 19th century. He um, had kidney failure, dilated heart, and what we would now understand as very advanced type 2 diabetes. Basically, everything was given up. And uh, he went to his own doctors and they said, right, you will. You've got three months. Goodbye. <laughs> and they handed him a bill. You know, uh, he wasn't particularly happy about this as you can imagine so <laughs> not only that he was a doctor he was supposed to be immune from illness and the doctors he went to you know, a bunch of shysters told him he was going to die and charged him money you know furious um he came up with food combining which has been the basis of many adaptations but if you get his old work which is basically we now understand it's not quite uh, scientific as he tried to make it, but basically separating starch-based foods from non-starch-based foods so that you've got simpler digestion. Now, you know with things like type 2 diabetes, digestion is a key factor. People are talking about the gut biome all the time now. Um, I remember attending the first Candida lectures back in 1988 when um, Acidophilus came in a, a three-quarter pint jar like this and we had to import it from America and it cost pretty much like $90 of powder and it was bright yellow and it stank because it was a side product from a waste product from the milk, milk industry. And it was the first thing we had actively as a, as a kind of process to probiotic. And what Hay discovered was that by separating proteins from carbohydrates and having either protein-based meals or carbohydrate-based meals, digestion was made simpler, i.e. 
you know, to digest protein, you need a lot of hydrochloric acid. To digest carbohydrates, you need a lot of enzymes. So actually, by giving an emphasis on one kind of meal at a time, you're getting a very, very singular form of digestion. And this got rid of all his kidney failure, his dilated heart. You know, the guy was like 150 pounds overweight, uh, got rid of his type 2 diabetes, and he lived on for a very, very long time. I think he died when he was 88, and, you know, he was being told that he was dying at 34. Um, he lived a very, very long time to remain a firmly wedged thorn in the side of medical arrogance about, yes, the latest operation, the latest drug, the latest sulfonamide. Um, no, nope. he actually said, do this with your food and it will resolve a lot of your issues. Now that is so simple. And this has come around with um, anybody here old, old enough to remember Fit for Life? Well, there's, there's two I can see, okay. <laughs> um, three, right. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, fit for life. Fit for life was just another variant. And this gets thrown up time and time and time again. But such a simple thing. You will find his original books still on um, the shelves of uh, old health food shops, junk shops, charity shops, thrift stores, whatever. You will find that information. And you know, for the, the sake of, you know, argument, one dollar later, and you have something that is the basis of digestive health. Add in such things as kefir. I know there is a sensitivity to milk in a lot of people at the moment, but interestingly, kefir-based yogurts, if it's made with whole milk, and is actually made with a good life culture, and you get it, um, we have an expression um, in England, if you let it get hairy, i.e. if you let it get very, very strong and very, very tart, you, know, you really let the bacteria grow. We'll consume all of the lactose, uh, the milk sugar will be gone. And you have an expensive probiotic capsule in a glass and you have a diet, you have a protocol. You have a protocol for literally anything that's going on because you're relieving the digestion, you're supporting the pancreas, you're supporting acid digestion and you're supporting alkaline digestion and you're supporting gout bacteria. You spend a dollar on a second hand book and you spent $20 getting all the bits and pieces together to make your own kefir. And as long as it's a full fat milk, I don't know what the experiment expression for American full fat milk is. Anybody? A uh, whole milk. Full milk, yeah. So as long as it's whole milk, everything in it, and it's organic, um, you've got yourself, you know, a $90 probiotic shop, you know, for a dollar. Really, really, really simple. But you started a nutritional protocol that actually has a prove, proven history of treating obesity, type two by diabetes, kidney failure, and as that, as a comorbid factor, cardiovascular condition. Not bad for a couple of dollars. Uh, one of the things that I'm still running into as a, a, a popular perception issue is that um, many people who have uh, indigestion symptoms assume that it's acid indigestion rather than alkaline indigestion. And so instead of getting their symptoms, let's say 10, 20, 30 minutes after eating, they get their symptoms two hours, three hours, or four hours after eating. They wake up in the middle of the night with their indigestion, but they think that it's still, they still think that it's too much acid rather than abnormally slow digestion. Yes. Um, I had a client on the phone this morning, very much in that mold. Um, did you know uh, that the Victorians and uh, Edwardians, you know, Queen Elizabeth I, um, used to sleep virtually upright. They would sleep on big bolsters and cushions. They didn't lie flat on their back. The beds were always much smaller. And we always assumed that these people were very, very small. They weren't. The, the, the health of the day was actually to sleep upright. Now, I myself uh, 
when I had diabetes um, many, many, many years ago. I'm trying to scratch my head now. 35 years ago, type one, uh, had this kind of problem, gastric reflux. And the old naturopath who, who was my mentor and, and was teaching me, he just said, sleep upright. And you know, I looked at this guy and I thought, well, what kind of lunatic are you? <laughs> sleep upright, what kind of, you know, put a coat hanger in my shirt and stand against a wall all night long? No, uh, but no, uh, I literally over, took the sofa over downstairs and just piled it up with pillows and actually sat basically propped up. It's the best night's sleep I have ever had in my life. No gastric reflux. No gastric reflux. Interesting. Why? Because, you know, all the valves are relaxing. And we know that this is an alkaline reaction. This is uh, a reaction with um, lactic acid forming right, in the stomach. It, it's a fermentation process. But because you're sitting upright, it drains down, it doesn't come up so to speak. And such a simple thing to do. Uh, and I remember when it was literally burning my lungs. He also said, wait for this one, sit in a bath of freezing cold water up to your navel. Right? Um, it's remarkably difficult to get anybody to sit in cold water, let alone freezing cold water up to your navel, but, and he said, and fast 24 hours. When I actually, I mean, big bad martial, art, martial artist, motorcycling, riding hooligan, not brave enough to sit in half a tub of <laughs> cold water, but when I did it, it just switched off just like that. And of course, you're changing the nervous system. You're, you're, you're kicking yourself out of sympathetic mode into parasympathetic mode. And so you're actually affecting the vagus nerve and you're actually flipping the metabolic switch. And that was from a, a burning attack during the day to, it was gone within 12 minutes. Something so, so simple bit of a problem if you don't have a bath. There are some other, some people have some questions. First of all, you mentioned some very simple techniques to uh, adjust how our thyroid is doing. I mean, like uh, with a sleep pattern, you mentioned on one of your videos, you know, simple things we can do to improve our sleep by adjusting the time we take our thyroid. Another question somebody has is, what do you agree with that Sarah Myhill uh, believes we should do, which I suspect is everything. I'll be seeing Sarah in a couple of weeks and no, we don't agree on everything. We have some very spirited arguments, but we have very spirited arguments because not all physiology is the same. And every case that walks in your door, even if it's a pair of identical twins, they are different human beings even if they are, have been primarily diagnosed with the same problem, it doesn't make an exact mirror. It doesn't make an exact mirror, precisely the opposite. So that the problem is with Groundhog Day and the problem is with baseline nutrition is that it is a baseline and that it will work for very, very many people quite simply. But some, because of the uniqueness of the question, whether it be their medication history, whatever, will need a different form of management. And so, no, I don't agree with everything that Sarah says, and Sarah doesn't agree with everything that I say, but we stack a good 85% of what we do and what we think and how we manage sits in the same area. And we are fundamentally dealing with two different conditions, things that have gone down different routes, but ME chronic fatigue actually is a recognized thyroid disorder. So next question. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody had the, uh, 
Okay, can you describe, uh, you, you know, you talk, I mean, there's a video you did about the timing of taking your thyroid medications because, you know, because there's a the surge of a need of thyroid during sleep pattern at some time. So by experimenting with the timing of your medications, that could affect the sleep. Could you discuss that? And other simple little things one can do to, you know, hack their health. Okay. Um the usual way of taking synthetic thyroid medication uh, is they say you're on 150 micrograms, um, which is a relatively low dose, I might add. You know, I see people coming in with 350. Um, and they say, OK, get up in the morning, have a glass of water or don't have a glass of water, depending on your position is take that glug down the water, have breakfast an hour later. Um, the thy human thyroid drip feeds thyroid hormone during the course of the day. There is a bit more in the morning than there is in the afternoon. There's a conversion going on and it's going from T4 to T3, synthetic thyroid medication, Synthroid, right, Levo, um, needs to be converted from T4 to T3. Some people don't have that conversion. But taking it all at once means that by the, time, by the time you wake up in the morning, it's gone. So uh, the, 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 the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is also released in the waveform. It goes up and down like that during the course of the day. It goes up and down. Okay. So people will recognize the humps and the humps are the morning when it's supposed to be up the thyroid hormone goes up to get you up the blood sugar level irrespective of whether you're on a ketogenic diet or an ordinary diet goes up to get you up more energy to wake you up there's a dip that goes at 11 there's a dip at three and then there's a bit of a wave increase you, you get a little bit more released depending on your physiology depending how well you're breaking it down and converting it there are a number of factors in this round about six and many people will recognize that i get very very tired at two and i have this flat spot of energy that goes from two till six when i seem to pick up and just before i'm getting to bed I seem to be awake. Um, so what you do is you divide, you, 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 you do a list and you say, when am I awake and when am I asleep? When is my energy actually crashing? When am I going downhill? When am I getting tired? And the three common times are, well, obviously first thing in the morning, about 11 o'clock, three o'clock, seven o'clock so eleven three seven now if you're on say 125 micrograms okay the first thing is pop your 50 as soon as you wake up um 25 at 11 25 at 3 25 at 7 so what you're doing is you're giving a little drip feed that's building up because these take about 12 hours to process. So that if you're taking some at 12, you at seven o'clock at night, you will be processing thyroid hormone through your sleep, making more to the T3, converting T3. And T3 is one of the key things actually to enable you to be asleep and enable you to wake up in the morning. Now, the thing about this waveform is if you're doing it for yourself, just to do, start off with doing morning and three o'clock. If you're doing it with a naturopathic physician, uh, an interested GP uh, or, or a functional medicine doctor, a functional medicine doctor will be able to sit down and work out what's going on the wave and actually split it up a bit more for you, a little more scientifically. But basically morning and three, start at three and begin to shift that dose so 125 if you're doing it yourself take 75 in the morning 50 at three and then are you good record the symptoms 
Move it to four. Are you good? Record the system. Move it to five. Move it to six. Move it to seven. Is it affecting your sleep? Is it giving you enough energy physically to sleep? Now, what I'm doing here is nothing revolutionary. Um, you will find this in the old books on such things as thyroid. I've got a wonderful old book here, The Diagnosis and Treatment of Diseases of the Thyroid Gland by George Kreil and Associates. Now, this was the book that everywhere in the, in the Americas, uh, this is a 1932 edition. You would have studied if you were studying thyroid. And in the old medical books, when they used to use NDT, desiccated cow thyroid, uh, uh, desiccated pig thyroid, um, that's how they medicated. They medicated until you fed, felt better and they spread the medication, not one big blast. So spreading the medication and actually having enough thyroid hormone in your sleep will enable you to sleep. Because what is sleep? Sleep is the time of regeneration. So during the day we use, for the want of a better argument, muscular energy. During the night when we're sleeping, we're using cellular mitochondrial energy because we're doing this takedown and rebuild job. This is made worse for people who are on sleep medications because at night when you sleep, your brain is supposed to shrink right? like that. This increases the amount of blood flow in the cavity in the cranium. Right? Okay, and this is referred to as the glymphatic system, system, and it enables you to wash the brain and get rid of the amyloid particles. If you're taking sleep medication, that doesn't happen. So sleep medication, amyloid material builds up. The, and people are taking sleep medication because they've been diagnosed as actually being sleep deficient. And, and the problem with thyroid problems is, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a snapshot, energy, my right? energy in sleep, my right? common symptoms, my right? chronic fatigue, excessive tiredness, less stamina than others, less energy than others, long period of recovery after activity, inability to stand on feet for long periods, inability to concentrate or read for long periods of time, nodding off easily, more fatigued and sore after exercise, feel weak, run down, sluggish, lethargic, sleep apnea, snoring, insomnia, 3 p.m. crash, needs a nap in the afternoon, weakness, dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting episodes, sudden loss of consciousness, wake feeling tired, frequently oversleep or don't sleep at all. All very basic, old school questions of GP. Uh, your own country doctor would have asked you, you know, are you getting those things? Thyroid, these are thyroid issues. Yet, if you walk into many doctor's offices who aren't clued up, about the vagaries of thyroid. They'll say, mm, right, actually, what you've got is um, flavor of the day, Mr. Mortstein's number nine sleep disruption pattern. Right. How many sleep disruption patterns, doctor? Only two. <laughs> There's number seven and number nine, and you've got number nine. That's it. Unfortunately, with marginal thyroid problems, the first specialist you get who can give you a label that's it, you're stuck with it. So from then on, your medication is aimed at that label, not aimed at you. So mixing, altering your thyroid medication and examining yourself for actually doing a, getting a basic thyroid test done with the antibodies and realizing that you your TSH be on the very low side in the UK, um, we reckon the perfect TSH is 1.2, and the level in the UK goes from 0.9 to 6 point whatever, 7 point whatever is the range they use. And people routinely uh, have a range of 6.3, and they're told, no, there's nothing wrong with you, it's within range. Um, not good. It should be down the extreme range. It is a range. So sleep, 
thyroid hormone, sleep medication, all of these things, um, you know, when you're mixing the two, it makes it worse. So literally sort your thyroid medication by splitting the dose. If you're doing it on yourself, morning, if your big slump is 11, take it 11. If your next slump is three, take it at three. Watch what's going on, record your symptoms, a record of symptoms, be proactive. And weird symptoms make a difference. Like for women, can you wear stiletto heels? Common thing is, I used to wear stiletto heels, I could live in them, my feet never hurt at all. Now if I put them on my feet, hurt. that's usually indicative of low iodine levels. And iodine is, um, along with the enzyme, uh, along with the amino acid or tyrosine, is the foundation of thyroid hormone. There's iodine deficiency in our soil. Iodine, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal. Right? Also, strips um, halides from the system. So we're talking about fluoride, bromide, chloride, fluorine, bromine, chlorine. Uh, also will help remove BCP uh, and other toxins. And it's used a lot in joint capsules. Uh, so again, you might not be making your thyroid hormone enough. It might not be a deficiency of thyroid at all. It might be a deficiency of substrate. And so for, you know, in a summary of that particular thing, just upon waking at three, keep symptoms, plot. If you're working with a functional medicine doctor, the band will be wider if they are a thyroid specialist and know what to do. Okay, everybody got that? Stephen. Um, <clears throat> what kind of, a, I guess, triage process do you go through in terms of assessing your clients and looking at relative issues of, let's say, neuroendocrine th thyroid problems versus, let's say, um, nutritional ones with iodine or selenium or um, other ones that might be, let's say, anti-thyroid toxicities that they might have on board? Um, I use initially a 15 page endocrine questionnaire um, and I ask all of the questions that an old school doctor and uh, Susan has a name for an American doctor who used to be in whatever uh, um, you know, the kind of doctor who used to live forever, so he kind of brought you into the world and kind of did the emergency heart operation when you died when you were 90. Uh, the, the old school GPs used to ask. So I use all of the, I use the questionnaires and the symptomology that they used before the wholesale taking on of measuring TSH and TS only back around 78. There is actually in the medical books, you can find this particular questionnaire for thyroid dysfunction. And I, I plot things down with a series of endocrine questionnaires and I send them out and I mark them from zero to three each question. And it enables me to put together a plot of, oh, right, there's an adrenal problem here, there's a thyroid problem here, pituitary problem, pancreatic, et cetera, et cetera. I come out with an order of uh, kind of probability, and that's the first thing, by asking questions and also asking clients what they think it is. Because the amount of time clients have gone into an office and said, thyroid, 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 and they, the doctor said, no, 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 I took your test four years ago and you, your TSH was in range. And I've, I've looked at the symptoms and I've said, hmm, Okay, let's do a full thyroid test. So we're doing TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, antibodies, you know, other thyroid linked mechanisms. And uh, you come back and yes, they've got a TSH within range, but they're, they've got a T4 of seven when it should be 14. They've got precisely half 
and actually wandering around on half the, the kind of metabolic energy uh, that they're supposed to have. It's because nobody has tested them beyond the TSH because they felt the TSH was in range. So the first thing, the first thing I do is I do I clear up the diet. Um, before we do anything else, I say, okay, let's eat right. Let's digest right, let's eat right. Probiotics, one, gut biome, enzymes. I got my PhD for designing digestive enzymes. Okay. Um, enzymes, hydrochloric acid. Are you digesting? Are you absorbing? Are you sweating? Are you defecating? I get that bit done immediately and the impact that will have on other things and especially actually just making wise choices uh, about eating is phenomenal it's also cheap and it's doable and it's a person actually pulling back their own power that's stage one stage two test the thyroid stage three iodine patch test. Now, those of you who don't use an iodine patch test, you know, it, it, it's fallen out of favor. But it is an old fashioned standby. You use 15% Lugol's iodine. You paint a patch on the inside of your wrist. Um, about an inch and a half square, three centimeters square, whatever. Um, Leave it on and see how long it takes to absorb into the skin. You're relying on the same mechanism and you, know, you get people saying, well, that doesn't prove anything. Well, it's the same mechanism that is used in HRT patches. So are you telling me that you know, absorbing through the skin doesn't work? So therefore, if it doesn't work, why are you giving HRT patches? <laughs> um, see how long it takes. In a person who has a very, very high eyes in loading, you'll get 20 hours. Uh, I see, see it disappearing on people's wrists in half an hour. Gone. Absolutely. It's like a magic show. So I then start them on iodine. Now, because we've sorted the diet and we've actually been doing things, the, the old school things about digestion, uh, maybe actually getting them just to prop the bed up a bit, put some pillows underneath them so they're sleeping slightly upright. So the gastric reflux is less at night uh, and that calms down getting the probiotics in. It depends what they're walking with, but this is the general approach, getting them digesting, getting them eating, getting the food into the system. Um, I prefer ketogenic diets uh, because a ketogenic diet will give you a very, very, very stable blood sugar level. And as you know, Stephen, uh, unstable blood sugar levels are like um, a whirlwind through the endocrine system. Um, you can't do anything to the endocrine system if you don't have a stable blood sugar level. So I work on blood sugar stability, digestion, secretion, adequate fluids, uh, be amazed how many people don't realize that drinking water is very different to drinking tea. Water is water, tea is soup. Drinking tea, drinking tea, coffee, drinking Coca Cola is actually a digestive process because you actually have to process sugars, bits and pieces. It's not, it's not clear. Um, th th those old school simple things that grandmothers used to scream at you you're not drinking enough water, not drink. You know, works, simple. That's how I go. So I go along the simple old fashioned routes until I jump into a problem. Many of my patients, you know, are really kind of confused by the fact that they say, well, are you going to send me off for a couple of thousand dollars, pounds worth of tests? And the answer is no. What? You're not going to send a test? No. I actually want you to eat properly first. I want you actually to do things that we know will make a difference that cost you nothing. And getting that stable blood sugar, which of course helps with adrenal function, 
which are helpful. Cortisol levels, uh, consciousness, fatigue, memory, sleep. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got a package that is beginning to roll along and actually be incredibly dynamic. Um, what's the risk of um, iodine supplementation um, regarding people with, let's say, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis? I knew someone was going to ask that. <laughs> um, Brownstein et al. have done an awful lot of work on this. And he has noted that people with Hashimoto's, um, there is a very temporary, for about three months, elevation in the TSH, and it goes through the sky, and everybody screams. And then it turns around and comes back down again. Now, I have never in my years of practice and using iodine actually had anybody react badly to iodine. And I specifically, though, I used Lugol's iodine, you know, which is a combination of iodine and iodide. The people who I have heard reacting um, of, from other practitioners have been using straight potassium iodide. And potassium iodide is not found as a straight substance in, it's always K and I. You know. uh, so I think it might be an iodide problem if it does occur at all. I have never bumped into that problem. And I think it's in all probability, it's because I'm not actually just identifying and doing a singular process of saying you need iodine. They've been sorting their digestion, they've been sorting their gut biome, they've been sorting out their food, they've been stabilizing their blood sugar, and then they are taking Lugol's iodine. So it's actually lining up all your dominoes in a row to actually get that effect. And it's actually not saying I will give you everything at once, but rather I will and I never give iodine without giving a liquid-based selenium. I ensure that they have selenium alongside the iodine, and I always recommend that actually the selenium and iodine are taken together in the one shot, or however they're taking it during the course of the day. When you say liquid selenium, is that like um, uh, selenite or selenate? Or is so, that some, some other kind of... We, we, um, in, in, in the UK, there were a couple of com companies that actually sell a, a liquid based selenium drops, selenium drops. So um, again, it depends what you can, go, you can get hold of. Uh, you know, I do have clients in America and uh, Africa and other places. And what is available there isn't available here and vice versa. But um, liquid selenium, along with the iodine, seems to be better absorbed and also putting it in water and swilling it around the mouth and swallowing it seems to produce some kind of action. And I think we might be down to, you know, I don't have the time or the money or even the inclination to follow this, but I think we might be down to old school RNA biotagging. You know, the actual swallowing of the medication and actually getting it in your mouth and picking, mixing it with saliva. Um, the reason I ask is because um, selenium inorganic is seleniums are hypoallergenic and uh, they're acutely toxic and not cumulative, cumulatively toxic, whereas organic ones are they, they accumulate in the body and the time difference is, is, is very substantially different that selenomethionine and selenocysteine take a long time to become bioactive, whereas selenite is instantaneous. Right, somebody's just requested that I give the name of the drops. The drops we use in the UK are made by BioCare and it's Nutrisorb Selenium. Um, Stephen, it's very much a question of 
treat what you find and find what the individual themselves is sensitive to or not sensitive to. And this comes down to actually doing a good case history and finding out what they were given before and if any of it worked. Uh, but yes, I, I, I get your problem. I, you will remember the old problem with germanium, I suspect. Yeah. What about sure. uh, kelp? As a as a potential iodine uh, dietary source, as opposed to, um, you know, let's say lugols. Um, works for some. Um, not for others. The volume that you actually have to pick up is remarkable. The thing about iodine is the, the body doesn't store it very well. If you think about it, as a creature, we evolved in the sea in a water-rich and iron-rich environment. We evolved on the coast, eating shellfish, iodine-rich, incredible amounts of uh, omega-3 EPA, developing our kind of a higher functioning brain, and um, lots of iodine. Now, iodine, works on the positive loss process. So you take in iodine, you use it, you don't store it, you urinate it out. Now in the process of urination, something very, very interesting happens. Any, anybody here who has intersexual cystitis needs iodine because what happens is as you urinate, it's going through the kidneys and remember, it's used basically for wound healing, raw tissue in medicine, it's still used. Um, and uh, it sterilized the kidneys because uh, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, it sterilizes the bad bladder, and of course it sterilizes the urinary tract. You're actually urinating a uh, neat Dettol. Do you have Dettol in the States? No, okay, Dettol is, is an old fashioned brown household disinfectant, which your mother used to slap over everything, including every passing child. <laughs> <laughs> He's a boy, he has been in the garden quick, dip him in Dettol, you know. Uh, yes, it, it, it's, a, it's an old fashioned disinfectant. So basically when you're using iodine, uh, you know, the body never does one thing, you know. Uh, it always uses the metabolite for something. And the process is that um, you take it in, you use it as much as you can. It will strip halides. And if you have enough, and this is a problem, it will carry them out. But the excess, some will go to make thyroid hormone, but the excess will go through your system, through your digestive tract. It kills hostile bacteria. It will kill infections. It will kill abscesses. Uh, it will kill cysts, it shrinks cysts, and it will go through the bladder, go through the urinary tract, and it will kill off resident bacterial infections in the urinary tract, like that. So the problem with iodine is you need a lot because you can only take on a little, but you need a lot to do these peripheral things. And the big problem about this iodine toxicity is, oh, I took a drop of iodine and I was insane for a week. Um, I was very, very ill. I must be allergic to iodine. What happens if you take too little, you will liberate halides. But you also need iodine to transport the halides. So what happens is people take too little as their own experiment. They liberate the halides, they're whizzing around in the bloodstream creating havoc, making you feel very, very ill. Uh, before they get stored back somewhere, possibly in abdominal stomach fat or somewhere like that. And they feel really, really ill because they've actually used one part of the process, but they haven't used enough to carry it out. And that's the thing with iodine. If you get the dosing wrong, it's usually too little. It's not enough. And of course, with the halides whizzing around, you get massive autoimmune reactions. And this is, I think, what people actually pick up on. They're not actually using enough to kin you the protosis. It's like these people who go, have got a, an infection, bacterial infection, they walk into the GP, the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, for this 
you know, you do actually need antibiotics. And they go along and they get the antibiotics and say, well, 500 milligrams and he's told me to take four a day. I'm not taking that many, I'm gonna take one or two. You know? <laughs> well, the guy didn't give them to you because he was bored. <laughs> he gave them to you because you had a, a rampant infection. And by not actually taking enough, all you're doing is prolonging the agony and sometimes making it worse. Uh, so you actually need enough. And this is where you should really consider iodine as a bulk mineral rather than a trace mineral, so to speak. The, the, the quantities you should be large. And interestingly, the, you, these websites you get on the, uh, on the net saying, you know, you take this much and you die. Um, the toxic level in the USA and the UK is less than the average daily consumption in Iceland, Japan, Norway. Now, technically, because of the amount of iodine they have in their food, if you ever come across a Japanese person from Japan or an Icelandic individual from an Icelandic bone, go and see a psychiatrist because we know they have so much iodine in them, they're all dead, so they can't be there. Well, okay, so we know they're there. When we know they're not dead, when we know they have a massive amount of iodine, let's look at the other things that are going on. Um, recent research, do you remember the, uh, the Icelandic super genome they were trying to crack? Uh, there was a project where actually the Icelandic government sold the Icelandic genome to a research company and they were looking in to see why are the Icelandic peoples so immune to disease so by and large healthy, pretty much um, you know, they're all tall and strong and they don't have the same rate of heart disease, they don't have the same rate of cancer, they don't have the same rate of HIV and uh, people say well it's a little island and they say actually you forget you know there is a very large American naval base on one end of it and um, uh, it has been known for sailors actually to go out with the odd girl on shore leave. So, you know, there is a cross contamination of all sorts of things going on and it's not happening. Um, why? Well, their ID levels are three, four times the average of everywhere else in the world, everywhere else in the, in the world. They're actually, their blood is literally swimming in disinfectant. It's known that the first studies they ever did with iodine, goiter and cysts, they painted it on you know, big black sheets on people's necks and got them to drink it. And in heroic quantities, goiter went down and the cysts shrunk. It's known that iodine actually has a role in the shrinking of breast cysts, ovarian cysts. Um, and could it be that, you know, the, the secret to the longevity of these people is actually in part the fact that they are saturated quite naturally with a very, very potent antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. Interestingly, thinking of COVID and I, there was some stuff coming out historically that quite a few doctors um, back during the uh, Spanish flu epidemic after the First World War, um, we were painting and spraying with those little perfume sprays, right, with a little rubber bulb, a, a Lugol's iodine solution diluted on the backs of the throats of their clients. Well, there was a paper that came out mm, about a month ago. Some guy, had, uh, doctor, had just actually been getting people to goggle using blue balls. And the clearance rate and the reduction of infection in the sinus and the throat and the bronchite was massive. That's not, you know, it won't make you a superman, it won't make a cure for something like COVID, but the reduction of symptoms and the reduction of duration and the reduction of impact is something, you know, certainly worthwhile knowing about and certainly worthwhile using in clinical practice. And thinking about that, I think my grandfather used to gargle with iodized salt when he had a sore throat. And that's what the GP used to tell him to do. Iodized salt isn't very common these days, uh, you know, red salt, iodized salt, but it was a process that people used to use. 
Any other questions? <laughs> What's popping up, people? Uh, Christine, would you like to ask a question? Um, hi, Steve. And um, I just got my answer thoroughly uh, about the iodine. It's wonderful. I've been wondering about this for years, and now I know what to do. Thank you. Good. A good self-care experiment, yes. I must buy shares in the company. Anybody else? Um, Ellen? Yes, I have a question. Um, so in regards to the iodine, I actually did supplement with iodine and um, my TSH went up to 16. I stopped suddenly, which was a really bad idea, but I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in 2018. And would you, again, just relating to uh, supplementing with iodine, if you have Hashis, would you suggest getting tested first? Um, I would suggest um, stable blood sugar level. Look, look, say that again, stable blood sugar levels. Uh, hashes is an autoimmune disease. And what you've got to do is um, work on autoimmune factors and this is stable blood sugar level either a paleo or a ketogenic diet watch out for some of the paleo diets because you get people who um saying you know bananas are paleolithic i can assure you they're not a wild banana is about the size of my little finger and has a thousand seeds in it and seems to be made out of uh, hemp cord, <laughs> right? A domestic banana is so big, right? Um, work on those autoimmune factors. Work on them very, very aggressively. So you, you, you want to do the diet, you want to sort out your digestion, you want to sort out your gut biome. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be masses of different kinds of bacteria from different companies make your own probiotic and consume it in the same way sort out your hydrochloric acid level sort out your digestive enzyme level if you have a hydrochloric acid left issues if you have gut fermentation if you have reflux work backwards so use lots of digestive enzymes but no hydrochloric acid support. Ignore the stomach, so to speak. So you get digestion, you get secondary digestion going on and you absorb the food, etc. And with the probiotics, by the time you start doing that, you begin to go around in full circle and the stomach begins to get better. Zinc levels, absolutely key if you have gastric reflux. Okay, so work on the antibodies, work on the autoimmunity, get a stable blood sugar level, then consider using something like iodine. And remember I say, this is the first thing I do automatically. I probably don't get these reactions because I'm standing back. I've seen the blood tests, they come in with you know, 50 pages of reports of, from amazing companies with really amazing pictures and lots of amazing graphs all saying fundamentally the same thing, all costing a thousand dollars a time. And diet, digestion, gut biome, water, stable blood sugar level, work on the biome, work on the antibodies, iodine, selenium, split your thyroid doses. Just that simple process will make a great deal of difference to how you're living and what you are experiencing. Well, you, you just said iodine and selenium together, and I'm, I'm getting that you're not suggesting I take iodine. I mean, I, whatever all you're saying is wonderful, and uh, those are issues that I am working on, and uh, those do actually make a big difference for sure, for sure. Uh, yes. But on top of all of that, should I be considering... Uh, See, the, Thyroid is a very strange creature as is thyroid hormone. Um, it's possible to be thyroid sufficient 
in most of your body, but one vital organ to be thyroid deficient. Now, we know a lot of heart attacks are down to poor thyroid function. We have three enzyme conversion mechanisms, D1, D2, T3, and they all happen in different ratios within different organs and different systems. Uh, so the one in the heart and the one in the brain holds on to the converted D3 quite aggressively. It won't secrete, whereas muscles and other cells that do conversion will actually put it into the general circulation. So, and this is key for the use of selenium. And as Stephen was saying, you, you need the right kind of selenium. You don't want to use something that is basically uh, a reject from a metalworks factory that somebody's actually bottled and is basically poisonous and will hold on. So you need your selenium for the conversion factor. And um, baldness, hair, right? um, selenium. Remember the days when they used to make selenium shampoo? Uh, and they used to rub in, well, it, Stephen will tell you, it was the wrong kind of selenium. They were killing themselves. <laughs> Belts in blue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it did work. It did actually work. And that's, of course, because they were actually treating the cells locally for doing the thyroid hormone conversion and making T3. So the iodine and T3 combined is, you know, is a critical factor because you can't get one without the other. It is a, it is, it is a game of dominoes. One over, two over, three over, four over, and you have to line them up in the correct order. There isn't a magic formula. It isn't, oh, I'll go out and get some iodine now. And you come home and you find you've got a bottle of Provotine, you know, for painting on open wounds. It's not the process. So Lugol's iodine, selenium together, and make sure you have enough. And your iodine patch test can pretty much tell you that. It's supposed to last 20 hours, 24 hours. Um, as I say, sometimes I see it go within half an hour. Um, Gilbert, would you like to pop in and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, what's the difference, uh, from your opinion, between Lugol's solution and SSKI? SSKI. That's, That's super saturated potassium iodide, so it's not any I2 at all. I tend to know, use what I know works. Okay, and I've come across all sorts of variants from nascent iodine to, I haven't used SSKI. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be a common pro product in Europe. Okay, um, I've been using Lugol's for pretty much 40 years. And, um, I will probably stick with it because I know what it does. I know how it works. And here's the big thing for my clients, it's cheap. And I am all for cutting, reducing cost. So I really can't give you an opinion on that one, Gilbert, because I'm not, I don't use it in my practice. I don't see any need for it in the way I'm operating at the moment. Um, obviously, somebody's thought it up and produced it, and it obviously works. What do you use it for? How do you use it in your practice? Well, it, it has um, recommended by a doctor. It has a clinic up in Washington State. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, I've been using it for years as a, um, a water purifier. Yeah. Uh, there's enough, and there's a, a lot of different things. I've forgotten a lot of them, but I was interested more in, uh, I have Lugol's as well. Uh, uh, and the SSKI is a prescription, so it's kind of hard to get uh, if you don't have a doctor on your side. But um, I, I like a, 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 a quantity, an iodine quantity, Lugol's would be fine to use as a gargle, safely. Uh, look, 
Lugols, and be, you have to be careful with any form of iodine as a gargle. Don't do too much, you can scorch your mouth. You know, well, that's it? why I'm saying how many drops and diluted in the water do you suggest? A couple, couple in a glass half this size. Mm. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's basically what I've been doing. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, uh, and swallow it afterwards. Oh, and swallow it. Oh, okay. I always spit it out. <laughs> well, you know, you'll get you 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 will pick up your iodine, and of course, um, something that nobody ever uh, mentions. Ladies, will you put please all put your fingers in your ears? No, no, I've no. Heard you. Put your fingers in your ears. You mustn't listen to it. This is a gentleman's conversation. <laughs> uh, prostate, iodine, oh. prostate. Uh, right, prostate is prostate disease is a thing that is not talked about at all. Right, you know, um, the guys all sit around in the bar and saying, "How's it going?" Yes, you know, but sort of, I'm still wonderfully virile. I'm 67. I'm only 250 pounds overweight. The diabetes is great, and I make love to my wife at least three times every five years. Right, you know, um, prostate disease. Prostate is one of those things that actually absorbs and utilizes a lot of iodine. And the thing about the prostate, it is a swine to get things into. It's an incredibly dense piece of muscle. And if you get an infection in the prostate, you will... Um... I've had clients come along who uh, were treated for social diseases, shall we say, in their 30s and they're in their 60s. And they still have residual infection in the prostate. Right. Just you cannot get the antibiotics in there. And this is why so many people end up mostly right. Yeah, right. This is where we'd be non-PC. This is why men end up actually having prostatectomies, because they literally can't get anything in there. But iodine is one of those things that you get into your bloodstream. And get eventually get into the prostate, and it helps with inflamed prostate, benign prostatic hypertension, uh, hypertension, well, uh, and hypertrophy, and uh, urinary tract infection. So you know it's equally important for men for those particular reasons. So you know it's it's one of those things all guys over fifty should be taking. Um, you know, prostate infections, uh, you know, talking prostate, um, you know, which I know is a divergent from thyroid function. I'm sorry, ladies, but, you know, you get your ovaries talked about. You know, so we, we'll talk about prostate. Um, using uh, the amino acid L-arginine and L-citrulline, uh, you know, there's a couple of good commercial formulas out there and actually take, mixing it with your iodine, you will actually can use it to open up the blood vessels and get the iodine into the prostate. Right. You can actually get the nutrition into the prostate. And as Stephen will tell you, it can be an absolute demon to try and treat long established prostatitis. And it's pretty much a misery, right? And that's why guys go for operations because it's so hard to get into there. But um, if you open up the blood vessels and you're mixing in such things as iodine with the formula, it will get in there and it will actually perform the, the process of supporting the prostate and actually sterilizing the tissue, killing all bacterial infection. Very I'd like to add a brief uh, a message, Gilbert, before you jump in again, that there's a lot of... Um, uh, legal manipulation taking place in the iodine uh, market because of the fact that iodine can be used to synthesize various illegal drugs. And so what you will find is that there's a switch from iodine, which is I, I, I2, uh, molecular iodine, to iodide because iodide cannot be used or at least cannot be used directly. And so when you go into a US pharmacy, chances are you're gonna find decolorized tincture of iodine instead of um, the classic um, tincture of iodine, which is very, very close to Lugol's iodine in its composition. 
So you have to talk to the pharmacist and insist that they order the old fashioned tincture of iodine or Lugol's iodine in order to actually get the I2 part of it. And my, my feeling is, is that there's a, a mechanism that, that iodide and iodine distribute in the body in divergent ways. And so you really do want the combination of iodide and iodine. Yeah. Uh, what I can tell you is, you know, Stephen, one of the classics is getting up in the morning and walking on your feet, trying to walk and feeling like you're walking on broken glass with a thyroid dysfunction. It is one of the classic symptoms of low thyroid, but that is also a classic symptom of low iodine, poor iodine levels. And that only happens when you get better, when you're using proper Lugol's iodine. At this point, I know Crow in America still produce Lugol's iodine and you can get it across the uh, internet. But if you go to a compounding pharmacy, it won't be because it's a street legal. It's, you're not doing anything illegal making it. You know, they, they can make you up, you know, 250 mil and that will last you five years. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's a, literally, um, it's so simple to do. You can look it up. And if you go to a supplier of, um, People who have sea fish, it's a fish tanks, aquarium shop, they will sell you both kinds of iodine, iodine and iodide. And you can mix them together and you can make Lucal's iodine. Oh. It, you know, you can buy you know, two little packets and all you need is a brown bottle and some decent water, non chlorinated, no strange things in it. You'll make your own. But what what's what would be the uh, the dosage there? Because uh, I I have some friends that have a koi business. <laughs> I'm going to ask them. Oh, well, you want to make fifteen percent? It's actually, you know, the standard in the UK. The standard naturopathic dose is fifteen percent. Absolutely. Of, of the iodine. Well, no, it's a fifteen percent liquid dilution. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So eighty-five percent water. Yeah, eighty-five percent water. <laughs> so so it, would, it will be ten grams of iodide and ten grams of iodine. Oh, five grams of iodine. Okay. Now, with, uh, as far as application, is it the same uh, gargle and swallow uh, for, for prostate? I have I have that issue too. Yeah. Okay. Basically, you can just make itself. You know, it's it's an old-fashioned home remedy. Every Every house out west you know, in the 1920s would, would, would have laudanum, which mm -hmm. they'd grow in their own back garden, marijuana, and uh, iodine, you know, and a steak for breakfast. You know? <laughs> yeah, we have to go back to those days. <laughs> well, thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Yeah, one of the things that uh, people are um, are now, I think it was um, um, Sarah Mayo who talked about uh, sniffing iodine or nebulizing iodine as a way of producing an antimicrobial effect, an antiviral effect in the nasal passages. And um, but it is possible that you can use something that's too strong to swallow. Um, just as a mouth rinse, and then you can spit it out so that you don't, you know, take, I don't know, <laughs> way too much iodine. So it's all about using the right dilution if you're going to swallow it. Yeah. So I say the standard dose is 15%. I would use two drops in a, a moderate sized glass of water, and I would wash repeatedly and spit out. And the last bit I would swallow. I'd wash and swallow and go down. Um, so, because it's quite a volume of iodine, right? Swallow. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And this yeah, I use a, I use a I nebulizer do. with 50-50 yeah. um, um, iodine, tincture of iodine and saline. And that's too strong to swallow. Yeah. Um, but two drops. I have a nebulizer too, I use... Um... Uh, what have I been using in it? Uh, recommended for science is um, ah, 
a little brain fog here. What is it uh, used for? Uh, um, you can nebulize all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, but it's it's a it's um the stuff you gargle with. Hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, sure. It, it, I was supposed to clear out your sinuses, but I don't know. I I didn't find I, it I as would, special effective. Would, I would personally stick with the iodine rather than nebulizing hydrogen peroxide and inhaling it. Well, well, it was diluted. It was diluted. You know. Oh yeah, it's it's, it's diluted way down. But the the issue with Iodine is that there is not a dismutation mechanism in our tissues. So when the iodine lands in the mucous membranes of the sinuses or the throat or whatever, um, it hangs around for a while. Whereas hydrogen peroxide, as soon as it's absorbed by a cell, superoxide dismutase and catalase and glutathione peroxidase just trash it. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I didn't find it effective. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, Old school doctoring knew, you know, quite a few tricks because actually, if your patient died, nobody ever came back here. Uh, so um, they voted with their feet or with the coroner, you know, one or one or the other, and you know the word got around. So a lot of what naturopathy is is remembering the medicine that doctors forgot because what happens when the new drug comes along and a new principle comes along, it tends to get thrown out wholesale. And then literally within half a generation, it's forgotten. But things that work, but may work slow, are, are still valid tools. And that is a lot of what naturopathy is about. And it's a lot about what functional medicine should be about, really. It's actually using those old school tools, which we used for hundreds of years and people knew it was safe. You know, um, I think, the first sign of the use of iodine as a medicine, they found a medicine hut in the Andes mountains destroyed by uh, an earthquake 3000 years old. And it was full of little preparations of seaweed which had concentrated down the seaweed for iodine. You know, a medication that doctors have been using for 3000 years, very, 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 successfully you know, so it's got a, a long history of predictability and safety so you know that's one of the easiest things that you can do for self self-management and you can do this um uh, there's something from vincent fong here where well, i guess it's good um about speaking up a little bit again. Oh, sorry about that. I, <laughs> I am, you know, hearing aids. Um, yeah, so doing simple things, getting back to the process of, you know, split um, the uh, thyroid medication, um, diet, stable blood sugar. Stable blood sugar cannot be overestimated. Interestingly enough, a vegetarian stroke vegan diet not why it may reduce fluctuations in blood sugar level, but very rarely will give you a solidly stable blood sugar level. So you are going to have to go towards the meat eating end. And that can be problematic for some people. But um, you know, that's that's where you head. How are we doing for time so so far? We're good. We're good. 30 minutes if you if you've got the stamina. Oh, I've got the stamina. I just want the questions. Yeah, you know. And you can talk as long as you want. There's no, nothing says that we have to stop it exactly at 6 p.m. Right. Okay. Um, so I've got a few things here that people may not be aware of, you know, with um, because we tend to rely on things like steroids and, or not we, but the medical profession tends to rely on steroids and antibiotics. You know, and you know, COVID is something that is on people's mind. Infections. Now, thyroid is known to be associated with um, chronic infections, chronic illness, low immune system, frequent cold, frequent influenza, susceptibility to bronchitis is a classic one, hard time recovering from infections, sinus infections, skin infections, ear infections, 
recurrent nose infections, recurrent throat infections, candidiasis, look at thyroid function. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, repeated urinary tract infections, upper respiratory tract infections, uh, and the inhaling of iodine works fantastically on anything in the sinus and the respiratory tract. I have seen some rather miraculous results of you inhaling iodine in the salt pipe. You know, people can build them. I made one here. It's out of two jars. It's got salt in the bottom. Flew off the top, put a couple of drops of iodine in. There's the cap. It's got some holes drilled in it. And a little plastic scoop on the top, holes drilled in it, and in between it there's a, a little bit of wadding to stop the salt coming out of the bottom and out the top, and just a salt pipe. It's really, really, really simple, and of course because it's sterile it can be used by every single person in the family. Um, works fantastically for bronchitis and also asthma, and it seems I make no claims, but it seems for very many chronic asthmatics, it reduces the, the level of attacks from 50 to 80 percent. And the thing that always worries me about asthma and thyroid conditions is what happens to all of the things, the powders they inhale, where do they go and what do they do to the base of lungs? I, I often kind of think to myself, if you've been inhaling fine dust for the last 30 years, because you've been using an asthmatic inhaler. What's happening in the base of your young lungs and is in fact your asthmatic attack to do with the fact that actually you're filling your lungs with these bits of dust because I don't see any way of them coming out. Um, do you have any thought on that, Stephen? Oftentimes that we cough stuff up and there's a, a cilial action to um, yeah. uh, also, whenever you have something in your mucus, mucus in the lungs, the white blood cells come out and attack it. And then they have to be disposed of by that kind of mechanism as well, cough it out. Yeah. And um, so <laughs> I think that's how it works. <laughs> well, that's supposed to be how it works, but I have had, you know, comments and observations from people or friends who have conducted post-mortems and saying actually oh we found that half his lungs were packed full of dust from inhalers but mm. it didn't go anywhere and um, I'm always worried about long-term medication that leads to long-term medication uh, so or, or pathology yeah <laughs> yeah one of the things that I've noted is in myself is that the, the, the speed at which I can cough something up depends hugely on the um, hydration of the mucus. And that's why things like guaifenesin are, um, where, however it's pronounced, um, are often use, useful for peop helping people with that um, you know, coughing uh, reflex. Um, and that a lot of people walk around with um, a, a, um, edema and cellular dehydration where their mucus may not be coughable. Yeah, it's, it's turning it's turning into a kind of very, very shiny barrier. It's, Sludge. Yes, yeah, an, an, an inflexible protein that, that actually isn't allowing the transmutation. Things can't cross across it. So that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, so getting back to thyroid. One of the commonest things I see, one of the other things I see is polycystic ovary syndrome. A lot of in young girls. Now there was a study uh, back in 2012 in the inner cities of the UK and it said that young girls were existing on a third of the RDA of iodine. In their diet, being a third, right? They were 66.666 recurring percent deficient in iodine. 
And this is rather alarming. And this was done by the Society of Endocrinologists and the recommendation was do nothing. It wasn't use iodized salt. It wasn't give iodine capsules. It wasn't eat seaweed. It wasn't go to a Japanese restaurant. It was, oh, this is what is going on. And so I'm seeing an increase in things like pelvic inflammatory disease and polycystic ovary syndrome much, much, much earlier. You know, young girls, you know, growing beards you know, and uh, spending a fortune on having um, uh, laser therapy to actually have the hair removed. And um, see, coming back to iodine deficiency and poor thyroid. And uh, again, it, it's one of these things that is quite offensive, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Yeah. Also, yes. it's one of the things that happens when your hypothyroid is that you tend to develop um, uh, the, the low metabolic um, rate uh, causes cells to become dehydrated and tissues to become overhydrated as a compensation for that. And it's often the, a, a very common symptom to see swollen ankles and puffiness in the face. Yeah, that, that, that moon-faced process. And it's bags better. under the eyes. Yeah, okay. Don't look too closely. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it is. Um, it's endemic in our society. And as I say, you know, I've got, cold, I've got 10, 10 pages of commonly occurring symptoms here. And, you know, I feel like I'm becoming a sort of like thyroid quack because I'm walking in and I'm saying, yes, thyroid, yes, thyroid, yes, thyroid, yes, thyroid. I didn't start out primarily as a thyroid based endocrinologist. It's just that it, it's just that it kind of happened. I began recognizing it and doing things and the word spread and more and more people came to me. But it is. Um, it, it, it's, it's the weird things like the latest thing is people with thyroid problems being turned away from work because when they, they point the uh, ray gun at them to test their temperatures of walking, their temperature's too low. So they're being told that they have COVID, but in fact they have hypothyroidism and they're having to actually say, no, I have low thyroid. That's why I'm cold, right? And you can see it on your machine. No, I don't have COVID. And besides, COVID's a fever. <laughs> Oh, well, well, what is happening? You're cold prior to getting the fever. Really? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a common thing. When you mix science with politics, you get trash. Well, yeah. Well, when you mix politics with anything. You know. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that uh, Emmanuel Ravisi um, came across, which I, you know, was probably like 80 years ago, was that, that there was a... a he identified this hydration abnormality where cells became dehydrated and tissues became overhydrated as a manifestation of hypothyroidism and hypometabolism. But he also found that potassium utilization was exactly inverted, that as the cells lose water, they concentrate potassium. And so if you do a, a, a medical test and you measure potassium in the serum and compare it to potassium in the cells, let's say red blood cell potassium, he used to use total blood potassium, that that predicts hydration and hypometabolism as well as any other test. Yeah, uh, there's a very good book um, actually on um, blood viscosity factors uh, by Dr. Leslie Simpson, blood, vis blood viscosity factors. And it makes a very, very good read and it highlights those kind of points for people who are interested. I just happen to have it here because I've stolen it from a friend. And I've noticed he's not here, so he doesn't know yet. <laughs> he hasn't missed it yet, right? <laughs> he hasn't missed it yet. Right. That's Dr. Jonathan Cohen. Uh, he runs something called FDX in the UK. And he, we call him um, Captain Blood. Right, because uh, pretty much he's the, the wisest man in blood chemistry in the UK that I know. So he's um, you know, very, 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 very interesting chap. So 
blood viscosity factors. Um, but does anybody remember the old hydration test? Yep, pinch skin. It should go down immediately, pinch. There shouldn't be a little line. Should, if, <laughs> Susan, have you found a little line on your hand? Oh dear. <laughs> Basic hydration, right? There you are. <laughs> look at your potassium factors. You know, look at your blood coagulation. But it should just disappear. Fully hydrated. Yeah, fully hydrated. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, I was a type one diabetic, and uh, I'm not now. You know, I'll eat a twink Twinkie bar if you want to watch me. You know, just to demonstrate that I won't die. Um, the blood doctor, Vincent, is Jonathan Cohen, and he runs a company called FDX in the UK. Dr. Jonathan Cohen. You're welcome. Um, where were we? Yeah. Well, let's let let me also ask you to talk about whether or not you provide consulting services to people um, from other places in the world than your local <laughs> geographic yeah, region. I, I have clients in every continent of the planet. However, I do remind them that UK time is different to Central LA time. Thank you. <laughs> it is surprising how many people, when you say, please phone me or we'll Skype at this particular time, UK GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. And they say, well, I was there at eight o'clock. And you say, GMT? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought you meant GMT, gin and tonic. No, no, Greenwich Mean Time. Right, okay. But yes, I do. Yes, I have a, I, I have quite a big, and, and the lockdown with COVID has actually made, uh, has forced me uh, kicking and screaming into the internet world, which I um, had thoroughly resisted for a very, very, very long time, because I am an old school physician and I do take people's pulse. I do to listen to people's heart. I do listen to their breathing. I do look at their tongue. I do examine their iris and their sclera. There are lots of indicators in the sclera that will can tell you um, or about uh, poor thyroid function and dysfunction in the endocrine system. It's old stuff. Um, the Cree Indians in America uh, had an entire system that they taught. And that system um, has 80% concordance with every other native system in, in the world. So, you know, looking at the sclera and, and we know, we know the sclera is a very reactive material. All you have to remember is your days as a student when you got out blind drunk and you came back in and you opened your eyes and they were red. Uh, they were bright red because of course you just done systemic cellular poisoning with embalming fluid, you know, and, and you believed at the time you enjoyed it, you didn't the next morning, of course. And that showed up in the whites of your eyes. It showed that actually every single organ had been affected by the alcohol. You know, you had a narrow squeak. But uh, yeah, so I, I do do those things. And interesting things for those doctors who still listen to people's hearts. I was taught to listen to the thyroid via the heart. Now we know that the you know, low thyroid function actually causes, can cause it heart attacks. And what you can pick up is between the lub and the dub, there is a very little but distinct point of no noise. Lub -dub. But there is between the lub and the dub, there is this pause, right? And it is while it is very close together, it's like you know, a gap in a wall, it is very distinct. And what you will hear if you have a good stethoscope, and I have an electronic one with, with amplification, which will pick up all the sounds, is that you can hear that there's like a fuzzy joining. There is it's it's not lub dub, it's lub -dub. It's one, it's one noise. The next time, if you get your stethoscope out, just listen to someone's heart and listen to, and listen for the lub and the dub. And of course, um, it should go lub dub. It shouldn't go lub dub. 
loud dud because that's actually an indicator of the mitral valve slamming shut and that'll tell you that you've got some pretty interesting things going on with cortisol and the adrenal function. And so there's a lot of those old tests around and of course Broder Barnes. Uh, I still use the Broder Barnes left armpit test first thing in the morning. I record it for a month because you can get a very good indicator of what the thyroid is doing day by day and stress and stress by day because it will plummet after a stressful day. And also with women, uh, it will give you a very good look at the rise and fall before and after the period so to see if uh, what's happening with the estrogen and progesterone levels if you do it for a month. It's cheap and effective and you can read it by the, day by day. It's very, very simple. Do you have an opinion about uh, um, vegan or vegetarian diets um, and their relationship to hypothyroid people? Okay, if, if you're listening to the audio track, uh, that was a, a negative. Don't do that, it. That, that was a negative, no. <laughs> um, vegan and vegetarian diets, right. Pretty much religions. Uh, and everybody is entitled to their own religious belief after the age of 21. Having children on vegan and vegetarian diets is not good, especially young girls. Um, you need the fats to develop the hormonal systems. And those fats are absolutely necessary for the reproductive systems. And um, if you don't get them, you're storing in a world of pain for them as they get older. Now, if, as, a, as a functioning adult at the age of 21, if you decide to actually accept that risk, fine. Excuse me. It's iodine up the nose from the inhaler. Um, so if you accept that risk, fine. But no, um, I have found in reality when people have walked into me and they have had thyroid problems, I cannot get them better if they're a vegan. To the extent that now my conversation goes something like this, are you a vegan? Yes. Are you prepared to come out of a vegan diet? And they say, no, absolutely not. I'm saving the planet. Debatable. Um, and say, well, in which case, I'm afraid I can't help you. Uh, you know, my dietary process, etc., 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 is based around the fact that you actually do need animal fats, you do need saturated fats, you do need L-tyrosine, the amino acids to make your thyroid hormone. And they say, can't I take a supplement? And I say, only if you want to eat chicken fats, because that's where the amino acid L-tyrosine is actually extracted from chicken feathers. So um, <laughs> it's not vegan. <laughs> so uh, no. Um, if you're a healthy vegetarian and you're healthy, you have a winning edge. If you're a healthy vegan and you're doing the right thing, so you're not being a starcher and you're actually ensuring that you get optimum protein levels from everything you eat. And so you have to be very scientific. You literally have to pour dal over everything. Um, you're okay. But when you get ill, uh, it's an entirely different set of circumstances and it's very 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 difficult to deal with um, can you talk briefly about um estrogen dominance um as you know how it might relate to iodine or thyroid especially in let's say constitutional versus inflammatory estrogen dominance uh where to start estrogen dominance Just a nightmare, just a nightmare. Um, the first thing with estrogen dominance, of course, is our society, we are continually stimulated adrenally. Um, uh, so the, the level of adrenal function 
with concomitant estrogens is going up and up and up because of course we don't have down times. Um, did you realize that the average person checks their mobile phone 150 times a day? 150 times a day to check for messages and other factors. Um, there was a very interesting lecture with the guy who uh, founded MeWe. Weinstein is his name? I, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, it's come out quite recently in a hit congestional hearing that Facebook was set up to be controversial and to be adversarial and to feed information continually to keep people hooked and keep people angry keep them angry and engaged and focused all the time. No, I don't agree with that. <laughs> Write something back. Engage in this, this kind of adrenal-based activity. Estrogen dominance. Where's the progesterone going? Where's it gone? Um, Well, if it's inflammatory, it goes into estrone. Yeah, yeah. but uh, um, Sarah Myhill uh, deals with this, and I started dealing with this by using um, pregnenolone in very small quantities because of what she calls the, the estrogen steel, or the cortisol steel. It, it sees that we're becoming so adapted to go down this estrogen, adrenaline, cortisol route that we do not have enough substrate, enough, ba enough base product to produce the progesterones, to produce the other necessary hormones. We're becoming maladapted via the stresses in our society, via the foods, the foods being stresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And our biochemistry is adapting by forcing every available nutrient down this one particular route. And it's turning off this route. So pregnenolone, so that you women can actually have enough straight so they can actually produce progesterone as a counter to this. And also, again, with estrogen dominance, stable blood sugar levels, lowering the blood sugar, lowering the blood sugar. Because if you lower the blood sugar, and get a nice stable blood sugar level, you're not having adrenal involvement. And again, that's the thing, dampen the entire system down. It's very, very hard to do for someone who's a stockbroker in New York, you know, where your job and your environment, or actually you're a working doctor and, and your life resist, you know, revolves around 12, 18 hour shifts and people in trauma and the diet, diet seems to consist of Krispy, Krispy Kremes and awful coffee. You know, you're, 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 you're thundering away like mad, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, you know, you know, um, <laughs> you know I see colleagues. sugar and caffeine. <laughs> it's, it's a roller coaster ride. Yeah, it's a roller coaster ride. And all of our lives have been led into this roller coaster ride. And, and until you can stop your own personal roller coaster, roller coaster, you are going to be stuck. And it doesn't matter the amount of medication, because what immediately happens when you are beginning to feel better, you go out and do more of it, you burn it. Right. That's the problem. Um, I've had people, no people, again, who are being PC, I've had ladies with acute estrogen dominance, and I've managed to get them better, and they've decided to celebrate by going on a nice restful holiday. So they went skiing. So they threw themselves down a black, a black run three times a day in minus 20 on two beds of slippery woods, wood with no brakes, with a cliff at the end of it. I wonder why everything came back with a vengeance. <laughs> Where's the downtime? Um, do you have- Hello? Uh... Oh. Go ahead. Hi, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Oh, good. Well, well, I, a couple things. On the selenium, um, the doctors have said that my level is okay, and I have Hashimoto's. Should I just 
I don't know. Should I just? Do you think I should take selenium anyway? Do you think people still need selenium? Look, your levels being okay is always interesting because in functional medicine and naturopathic medicine, we tend to operate the tad more precision. Oh. Tad, tad <laughs> more understanding. I, uh, do you drive a car? Yes. Right, okay, I will give you a level is okay scenario. You're driving down the street, just toodling along with a pleasant 75 miles an hour. A policeman pulls you over and says, Madam, you were speeding. And you say, but officer, my speed level is okay. Look at the speedometer. It goes from zero, <laughs> zero to 125. <laughs> I'm within right. the... That I'm in within the accepted level. Mm -hmm. uh, right. That is level is okay. Mm. Are you at the top of the level? Are you at the bottom of the level? And of course, what is your iodine level anyway? Do you have adequate amounts of L tyrosine in your desert a diet? And this is one of the reasons why we use milk-based kefir homemade yogurt because it does actually have L-tyrosine in it. So it's a bioactive form of L-tyrosine because of the bacteria and combined with selenium, combined with iodine, you actually have pretty much a lot of the metabolic cycle of, of the manufacture and the utilization of T4 to T3 to energy. So it won't necessarily be, uh, it's not tyramine, it's L-tyrosine, different. Um, okay. So you actually have to look at this rather than walking forward and doing that. Sometimes you have to step backwards and do that. You have to look at the entire picture. And this is where functional medicine and naturopathic medicine wins out on that. If you're in a car wreck and you're in pieces, go to A&E. What do we call We call it A&E, Accident and Emergency in the UK. I forget what they call it in America. Right. Emergency room? Yes, emergency room. Uh, yeah, so you know, go to A and E, accident and emergency, and get mm -hmm. a to stitch you back up. Once he lets you out, right? Never go back. Uh, right, okay, and yeah, <laughs> never go back. Go and see a functional medicine doctor. Go and see an old school naturopath, or go and see an old school doctor who's been practicing for the last sixty years and trade it trades his services for chickens and potatoes get better naturopathic medicine functional medicine is not very good as a primary medicine sewing people up mending broken bones etc 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 pulling out bullets and uh, you know removing children's heads from buckets and pots you know, that, right. that's what surgeons do but once you walk once you've walked by them once you've got an issue with diagnosis go and see someone who actually operates in the process that works alongside you and your body. Yeah. They don't always take insurance. Unfortunately, I'm on Medicaid, but whatever, I shouldn't work. Yeah. They don't take it. A lot of them don't take insurance, but is that something, I guess it's worth paying out of pocket, I guess, or. Um, right. I'm sorry. I'm having a, a bit of trouble hearing you. It's a, bit well, oh, a lot of them. Don't let me, take insurance. Let me, answer, let me ask oh. answer that question in a in a in one sense of of selenium. If you're taking sodium selenite, um, that's anywhere between one cent and ten cents a day. And the stuff that I make, it's a hundredth of one cent a day. And to get my selenium level into the top quartile, where cancer risks are, let's say, half of what they are if you're in the bottom quartile. And COVID survival is twice as good if you're in the top quartile as the bottom quartile. So, you know, just overriding the system by just taking selenium is one way to handle it. As long as you know not to go, let's say above 300, 300 micrograms a day so that you're going over the top of the curve to the toxic side, um, but it's easy to stay away from that. You, you know, so that's not really hard. So you don't even need to have insurance coverage for that kind of assessment. No. taking selenium that's just one example of it yeah so vitamin d you might be spending you know 10 cents a day <laughs> yeah right right uh, um, iodine 10 cents a day if, yeah. if you're making a lot 
you know, it's really, it's really cheap and it's really easy to do, but it involves you actually making a decision that you will fundamentally, for your baseline health, mm -hmm. take charge of it yourself. Right. right. And it used to be 30 years ago, every Sunday you would find your father outside mending the car, checking the tires, changing the oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There's a shift now. People don't mend their own cars. They take them to a garage. Right? They take them to you know, a mechanic. Funnily enough, you can still change the oil between previous life. You can still check the tires. You can still change the points. You can still change the plugs. You can still change the fan belt. You can still do routine maintenance that will only cost you time and a tenth of the cost of taking it into a garage, if that. Human bodies are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Think on your feet and do it for yourself. Right, right. Yeah, it's time. It's time. Um, yes. Yeah. I want to get your feedback on one more thing. Um, I have Hashimoto's. I spoke to a holistic doctor years ago, and they were saying, they said to me, do you have a root canal? And I think it was um, a, a tooth that was, a, you know, that affects the thyroid, I think three or four. And it turns out I do have a root canal. So she was saying, that's why you have a thyroid disorder, because you have a root canal in one of the teeth that are, you know, affects the thyroid. I think it's like three or four. Because root canals are, you know, it's like dealing with a dead tooth. So I want to get your feedback. Um, she suggested having it removed. I didn't have it removed yet. But I want to get your feedback regarding... Um, teeth and the thyroid. It's actually okay. infection and the yeah. thyroid. Can, can, I, can, I, can I summarize this? You went to a, a natural medicine doctor who wanted to get your thyroid better by pulling your teeth out. Right, okay. Um, Stephen's right. Uh, Hal Huggins, I just saw an interesting study, said that 80% of root canals had continual infection in them. I actually met Hal and went to his one of his, le his lecture series in the UK. Um, very, 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 very difficult. Um, however, you can treat your thyroid, you can use the selenium, you can use the iodine, you can do the protocol. This in its own right will help you reduce the infection because remember, what is iodine? Antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antiseptic, antiparasitic, okay? So doing your selenium, doing your iodine, doing your diet, stabilizing your blood sugar, stable blood sugars reduce the incidence of infection and reduce infection rates. Infections love sugar in the bloodstream. You can do things to bring this down. You might not be able to cure it, but you can bring, you can reduce the impact on your physiology and support your thyroid. Vote with your teeth. Right, literally, most people are digging their grave with their teeth. So literally turn around and start eating wisely and sensibly and you will get there. Um, and who knows, I don't know what all your concomitant health factors are, but by doing this, your blood pressure may come down. You might not need blood pressure making meds anymore. Um, you won't feel so woolly minded. So actually you're not clinically depressed or, uh, suffering from some kind of psychosis. You'll get rid of those meds. If you're lucky, all of a sudden you're not paying out for all these massive repeat prescriptions. All you, then need, all you then need is a decent dentistry. And the thing about decent dentistry is, this is going to sound odd, that if you have root canals, get rid of them because of the metal and the fact that they're all infected, um, get rid of them. And you have two options. You have implants, or you have three, bridge, implants, plate. If you don't have money, the old fashioned, pink plastic denture that you see in the movies and your grandfather would have had will actually chemically be the safest option other than having 
zirconium implants, right? Now, zirconium implants are the same as zircons, you know, false diamonds, and they are a white ceramic and they have no metal. They're wound into the jawbone exactly the same as a titanium implant. And um, you then get crowns put on top, either porcelain or zirconium. Uh, and they, because they're a mineral, they bond perfectly with the bone. And so you also get what is known as the piezo quartz, the piezoelectric stimulation from a zirconia implant, because when you bite on it, it gives a little electric shock into the door, jaw, which triggers, triggers, triggers nerve pathways. And that, that is a very key factor. Right. So if you sort out all the other stuff, you might find yourself with enough money to actually go and get yourself a nice Hollywood smile that is um, ethical and approved and it will keep you healthy. Right. So work on the things you can work. Get rid of the other things. Do the best you can. Bring down the inflammation, blah, 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 blah. And then you've got this final thing. Don't actually waste money by going from pillar to post. Start off baseline. Sort the digestion, sort the gut biome, sort the diet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Get yourself in a state where all other factors are bringing down antibodies. You don't need any medication for anything else. You can then attack the dentistry. And if you can't afford it expensive, go for the old fashioned pink dental denture. It is actually far safer than actually metal bridges and uh, metal implants. And infected teeth. And infected teeth, yes. Uh, infected teeth can kill you. Uh, there's a very good dentist in the UK called Dr. Elmer Jung. And if you look on his website, he does, he's got some very, very good um, illustrations of jaw necrosis. Now, one of the things that you need you need to go to a proper orthomax surgeon to have the teeth removed. And this is because dentists, when they remove teeth, leave the socket open. And they say, wash your mouth with salt, wash your mouth with this, wash your mouth with that, and it will close up and be okay. If you go to a surgeon, what he does is he pulls on the teeth and he scrapes around in the socket and removes any form of necrosis or bacteria. He will wash it out with iodine, right, which your dentist will not do, and he will then sew up the gum. So the socket is not left empty. And depending, yes, ozone is used by some of them. Film Jedi, may the force be with you. <laughs> um, fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, hold on a minute. Um, he may actually use some bone media or something to enable the uh, jawbone to grow back before the implant, right? if he's going to do implants. But you want that level of attention to your jaw. Right? Uh, so, you know, old fashioned going to a fairground and somebody pulling your tooth for 10 cents uh, and not doing proper surgical technique afterwards is not wise. Does that help? Yes, oh, hello. Yeah, I was muted. Um, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. They had a lot of good um, suggestions. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I just have time. Yeah, I don't know. I think the root canals, the mercury fillings, that's all. I know I'm going to have to deal with that one of these days eventually. The thing is, you can deal with the other stuff cheaply and immediately, and that will make a difference. That will make it right. Easy. Start that in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. What was his name? Doctor Young. Who was he? Uh, in the, the UK. Yes, Elmer Young. Elmer. Elmer. E L M E R. Yep. Young. Oh. J U N G. And. Oh, J U N G. Okay. As in Carl Gustav Young, psychologist. Yep. Um, oh. He, um, just have a look at his website. He's got some very interesting things. Elmer there. Young. Okay. John okay, course. great. Thank you. Somebody asked about fibromyalgia. Um, the simple answer is it is a thyroid problem. It's also an iodine problem. 
it's an inflammatory reaction. Iodine, selenium, L-tyrosine, gut bacteria, salt the thyroid, and salt the thyroid medication. Um, most people are on T4 when they need T3. Okay. Uh, so try and get hold of, try and get your T3 taken and see whether you need to up your T3. Some people do not convert T4, uh, thyroxine, um, levo to um, T3. And that is a key factor with fibromyalgia. Now, the problem with T3 is there isn't a naturally occurring T3 that you can get. Uh, you can get, there is NDT, natural desiccated thyroid, and there is also um, WDT, whole desiccated thyroid. Now, these are both extracts of thyroid gland that contain T3. NDT is a, a, a very standardized product. Most of you will recognize it as Alma, but there is a dozen different, well, there's hundreds of different makes. And in the UK, uh, clients tend to buy theirs across the internet and use something called Thyroid S, which is about a hundredth of the price of Alma. It's dollars to cents. So a uh, thousand Thyroid S grain capsules would be about $150, which is not bad. Um, in the UK, we use a lot of WDT, whole desiccated thyroid. Now, whole desiccated thyroid is somewhat different because it's a whole desiccated thyroid. It contains all the metabolites and it contains all the signaling pathways. So it's not necessarily used it's used for thyroid support, but it's not used as a T4, T3 replacement. You're using it because it's got some naturally occurring thyroid hormone, but primarily you're using it because of the signaling and the feedback mechanisms, which you don't get from um, synthetics and you don't get from NDT because NDT is actually partially synthesized. Uh, and if the level isn't right in, in the batch of the T4 and the T3, they will chemically adjust it. So there will be sometimes a bit of synthetic T4 or sometimes a bit of synthetic T3 in there to keep the level at the same uh, level. So um, WDT actually is, is the preferred medication, but WDT has an impact on the entire body um, in a way that Thyroxin, elotroxin, thyro, and NDT don't. It actually has a far wider sphere of operation. So sometimes you actually can use a small amount of WDT alongside your thyroxin because you will get the signaling mechanisms occurring and this will help increase conversion of synthetic T4, but some people just literally do not convert synthetic T4. They're on 10 times the amount of levothyroxine that they actually need to be because they literally aren't converting and it's just converting by the law of mass action. So your T3 level is pretty critical. Make sure that your endocrinologist, your doctor is actually testing the T3 and again, do not accept the, the thing of um, it's in the range. Is it at the bottom of the range? Is it at the top of the range? Is it in the middle? It should be in the upper third of the range, as should your T4. They should both be in the upper third of your ranges, not in the middle, not towards the bottom. So check the T3 if you have fibromyalgia. Check the iodine, do the selenium. Also, antioxidants, again, gut bacteria. We're actually in two hours. Um, would you, are you open for some last minute questions? Sure. No okay, problem. everybody.
Mary. Um, coming on, yes. Hi. Um, you just mentioned uh, not converting T4 to T3, and that is my case. I have hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, and um, I, after eight months of treatment with uh, tyrosine at 50 micrograms for eight months, and the conversion is not taking place. So beyond the selenium, the antioxidants, and the gut care, is there anything else that I can do? Look at your iodine, look at your antioxidants, uh, look at your um, toxin burden. You may have a very, very, very high halide count. Um, what, what count? Halide. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are the halides. Okay. Uh, oh, no, chlorine, bromine, um, damn, I lost it. What's the one they put in the toothpaste? Fluoride. 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 Yeah. Fluorine, yeah. Yes, yeah, fluorine. Um, iodine will push out the other three. Okay. So it may be that your conversion is down to the fact that you have something blocking the conversion. And this is usually down to one of those three chemicals. And... Um, so, what do you do for a living? I work as a life coach. As a life coach, right. Well, bromide and new furniture, new cars, new plastics, right, new plastics, all are very, very high in fire retardants, mm -hmm. as are new synthetic carpets higher in fire retardants. And these things block thyroid receptors. Hmm. Bromide, bromine is one of the main components of thyroid receptors. So if you're sitting in a wonderful white office with brand new white carpets and brand new white particle board furniture, I'm afraid you're going to have to throw it out, and get yourself some very nice 150 year old Afghan rugs and some very nice elegant <laughs> carved. But no, what, 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 you know, um, here's an interesting thing. I can't drive in a new car. It makes me sick. Hmm. Actually, physically gives me motion sickness. Put me in an old car, not a problem. Because new cars, because they're all plastic and they have incredible amount of um, halides, I immediately get a sick headache and I feel hmm. yes. Do you remember, uh, Stephen, remember this sick building syndrome? Uh, they were running around tearing out air compressors and all sorts. And it was at the point when they changed all the furniture into particle board and put oh, I see. nylon carpets covered mm. in Teflon and chemicals all over them. And the people were actually being sick because of actually the off-gassing of the chemicals around them. So you want to look at your halide burden. I was tested for heavy metals and that didn't really reveal anything worrisome, but I am, my doctor is now wanting to give me Cytomel. Give you? Cytomel. T3, monotherapy. T3. 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 Yes, right, T3, right, Cytomel, yes. Uh, that's one of the things that may work, but remember, you won't pick up halides on a heavy metal test. I see. But the, the problem is blood tests are always to get a blood test, you have to guess what it is you want to test for, and then you have to test for it. So when we say, we'll send you off a really comprehensive test, we kind of go, I think we need to test for that. Right. It's not that comprehensive to actually test you completely for everything that could influence you. I could drain you five times over and still not cover all the bases. So uh, yeah, halides. Do an iodine patch test. They're really old school. And see what happens. Now, Thank you. sometimes people do an iodine patch test and the iodine patch test lasts 48 hours. This is not good. This means that you actually have so much halide that the iodine itself cannot soak into the body. Literally just sitting there. So a long-acting test is not necessarily a good test. Can you remind me what type of iodine I ought to be using to do this test? Lugol's iodine, 15%. Okay. 
I live in France, and I'm not sure this is going to. It is. I have patience in France. Okay. And you can buy it on Amazon. You might have Thank to you. deal with your customs people, but that's uh, a lot of things are going through customs nowadays just because bureaucracies are downsizing to control expenses. Yeah. So you know, there are lots of suppliers in, in on the continent in the UK, so it's not a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? That's it. That's it. That's it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, yes. I'm sure we can do it again at some point and uh, just do the simple things. Split your doses, find out the peaks, find out the troughs, use it there. Dr. Lugol was French. In fact, Professor Lugol was French. Thank you. From Simona to everyone. <laughs> um, split the doses. Diet, diet, diet. Stable blood sugar, stable blood sugar. Stable blood sugar pretty much mends anything. Um, try to get your essential fatty acids in and try to get your saturated fatty acids in. Ensure that you have a good gut biome. So literally old fashioned kefir yogurt and make it as strong and as hairy as possible. Iodine, selenium, yes. L-tyrosine, yes. Um, do the simple things, split the doses, you will get there. And every small change is a victory because right? you're taking it back and you begin to things. And one day you walk up a staircase and your friends say to you, did you know you ran up that staircase and you didn't stop in the middle puffing and breathing and going. <gasps> <gasps> Most of the changes will happen to you. You don't actually notice until other people point them out, like your feet no longer hurt. You no longer get cramp when you're writing. Um, classic lack of iodine is fuzzy brain, woolly head, cannot think. For some people, iodine supplementation is actually miraculous. The brains wake up. It literally is like a magic show. Yeah, we call that brain fog. Yeah, in America. Right. yes. When I can remember, in spite of the brain fog, you know. Ah, no, it will just go for it. Take your own health in your hands and be your own advocate. Simple, cheap solutions work. Remember, old, good old Dr. Hay. Right. He separated this, his. This has been wonderful. And I'm so glad that you're open to coming back because there's a lot of comments on how helpful your information is. And uh, I'm very grateful you're here. And we want you back. Well, um, if you go to mewe.com thyroid care group, uh, I have a web page there for anybody who has thyroid difficulties and we all offer support and we do, there is information about what to do, and why to do it. Hang on. And we use MeWe because it's far less frenetic than Facebook. They also have a, a kinder and gentler uh, censorship policy. Yes, they don't censor you because you don't, you, you disagree with- um, The World Health Organization. Yes, quite. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, there's a lot of stuff typed in the chat. So um, please feel free to save the chat um, if you're on a cell phone and can't figure out how to do it, I can't tell you, but um, I will have a copy of the chat that I can send to you if you get in touch with me. And put your email addresses in the chat if you want to be on our email list, uh, because we have weekly Zoom meetings with phenomenal experts. Thank you all. That's Thank it. you. It's, Thank uh, you. Roderick. Half past six. And, uh, yeah. We're good. Yep, we're good. It's good to meet you all. It's nice to know there are people out there who are actually advocating their own health and change. Keep at it. Thank you, Roderick. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.